Assalamu alaikum. Your Highness, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my uh, great pleasure to be here. I have been extremely impressed with the efforts of Qatar to change its economy and its science from, from a energy-based industry to a knowledge-based uh, industry, and I'm extremely supportive of all these efforts. And I wanted to come here and share with you a really a view of the current trends and challenges in biomedical research. In a very short time, try to identify for you what are the key elements that face us today worldwide in terms of our challenge and the need for more research in the issues of biomedical um, advances so that we can, in fact, help the people of the world who are suffering today from a different set of diseases than were present a uh, hundred years ago. So if one wants to understand where the challenges are, one has to understand what has happened over the past 100 years. The main progress that has been made has been a reduction in the impact of infectious diseases and acute conditions. For example, in the past 30 years, there has been a reduction of 70% in the mortality related to heart disease and stroke. The 70 years before that, there has been an increase in life expectancy from about 40 years around the world to 75 years. During that time, the discovery of the fundamental elements of biological systems has occurred. With the discovery of the structure of DNA, 1953, all the way to today, we have essentially been able to identify the fundamental elements of biological systems, it will be DNA or RNA or proteins. We've gone even a step further. We have understood now how these are organized into functional modules. For example, how is DNA replicated? How is it transcribed? How are signals between cells conveyed? And how is the metabolism of cells and tissues and organs? We have a much better understanding today than we have ever had. And we've had, through technology and through fundamental research, developed tools that we never had the potential of using in the past 100 years. Would it be the sequencing of the human genome, which we can do now at less than $10,000. When we started the project at the National Institutes of Health in the 80s, the 1990, 1991 period, we estimated that it will cost $3 billion to sequence the first human genome. Today, we can sequence the genome of thousands of organisms, bacteria, viruses, in a day or two. And we can sequence the human genome in the, what we call the exome, or the significant portions of the genome, in less than a week. So these, this progress in analytical techniques, mass spectroscopy, the ability for us to understand biology better is also, at the same time, the, 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 the most important advance that we can now apply directly to the problems that we're facing. So if you want to look at the challenges today, if you're a policymaker, what are the real challenges that all of us are facing? Well, the first one is because we've been very successful in combating infectious diseases and acute diseases, we're now facing chronic diseases. In the United States, 80% of the spending on healthcare is spent on chronic diseases. No longer are we really challenged by acute, short-term, lethal conditions. At the same time, because life expectancy has increased, aging of the population is becoming a great challenge with new diseases that we have to tackle. The third is that around the world, and even within countries, there is a tremendous amount of disparity. We see, for example, diseases of the past in Africa, but at the same time, we see diseases of the rich world appearing around the world. There is an epidemic of obesity and diabetes, and all of these new diseases require us to have a different approach to biomedical research. At the same time, we are seeing infectious diseases reappear because of the growth of the global population, the breakdown between the environment and the population, and rapid transportation that are basically can spread an infection around the world in a matter of hours. And we are seeing also the emergence of non-infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases. If you look at the 
projections of the World Health Organization, the number one condition that will create disability in the world is depression. Depression in young adults between the ages of 25 and 44 is projected to become the number one cause of disability in the world. We are seeing the growth of allergy and immune diseases related to changes in our environment which we do not understand. At the same time, we know that we have a pandemic of obesity in front of us. But obesity itself is not a threat. It is the consequences of obesity that are a threat. So when you look at chronic diseases and you ask me, where is the fundamental research challenge of the next 30 years? It's chronic diseases, in particular, the impact of obesity, which leads to diabetes, type 2 diabetes. But if it, wasn't just, if it was just type 2 diabetes, it wouldn't be so much of a problem. But the problem is that after a few years of diabetes, more comorbidities occur in terms of higher incidence of heart disease, renal disease, eye disease, nerve disease, and infectious disease. In fact, there is a new term that has now appeared amongst public health experts. We no longer call this diabetes or obesity. We call it diabetes. And it has the potential to slow down the progress we've made over the past 100 years. It has the potential to shorten life expectancy. So the question in front of us is we as researchers and public health experts and policymakers, how can we direct the research forward? Well, the first thing we need to understand is that when you face an acute condition, an acute disease, an infectious disease, for example, you really have to intervene at the time the disease appears because you have absolutely no way of predicting that one is going to suffer from the flu. However, in chronic diseases, what we have learned is that the disease tends to occur years before it becomes apparent. In other words, the human body has enormous reserves against any long-term disease that appears. For example, diabetes, we know that we can in fact overcome the early stages of the disease for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. The same thing is true in heart disease. The same thing is true in Alzheimer's disease. The same thing is true in Parkinson's disease. And the challenge, therefore, is no longer to believe, like we have in the past 100 years, that you only go to the doctor when you're sick. So the paradigm of the past 5,000 years has always been to treat disease when the symptoms appear and the function is lost. And this was OK for acute conditions, but it cannot work for chronic diseases. If you wait too long, the disease is no longer reversible. We did not understand the molecular and, and cellular mechanism of these events that led to disease. We do better today. And because we intervened very late, the costs were exponentially greater than if we envision an era where, in fact, we will intervene before symptoms appear and preserve normal function as long as possible. So if there are two messages for this talk is chronic diseases is the challenge, intervening early and prevent loss of function is the second challenge. Now, we believe we can do this better because we have better tools and we have a better understanding of molecular events. And we have biomarkers that tell us increasingly who is at risk for developing a particular disease. And we need to focus, if you will, on these solutions that will prevent the population from suffering uh, at later stages. This is what we call the future paradigms of, paradigm of medicine. We're going to go from a medicine that was reactive, that intervened late when patients were sick, to a medicine where we will strike the disease before the disease strikes us. But to do that, we need four pillars. The four pillars is what we call the 4P medicine concept, and that is that we need to be more predictive. So research, whether it be here in Qatar or anywhere, has to work on the concept of being able to predict the presence or the likely development of a disease process. Second, we know that human variation is so great that there is no single solution that can work for the entire population. The solutions have to be personalized. 
And if we understand the mechanisms that lead to a disease process, hopefully researchers will come up with methods to preempt the disease altogether. We already have examples of that. There is a vaccine against cervical cancer. We have been able to develop the vaccine because we were able to predict how the disease developed and therefore develop a vaccine against the virus that created the cancer. The fourth pillar is that we need to develop health systems that involve the population and have a component of participation in care. Why? Because patients are no longer going to be sick and know that they need to go to the doctor. We hope to intervene way before they are sick. So this concept is what I, I, I describe as the concept of precision medicine. This is where we need to go uh, in terms of biomedical research. Now, when I say that and I tell you about all the progress we've made, you might think that progress is happening at a very fast pace, but it isn't. We have a challenge in front of, in front of us. If you look at the new molecular entities, which are the new molecules that are approved by the, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the US, and you look at the number of molecules that we approve every year, the number has decreased. In fact, we approve less medications today than we did 10, 15 years ago. Why is that? Why is it that we're not, we're not able to develop the treatments and the cures at the, sp at the pace that we need to, to achieve today? This is a real problem. Uh, industry has spent more and more money on research and development. I will give you an example. When I was director of the NIH, we spent $30 billion for re biomedical research. Industry, biotech, and pharma spent $65 billion a year, twice as much as what the government was spending. And at the same time, the number of new treatments was not increasing at the pace we needed to increase. In fact, we have a challenge in front of us. And I would say that if you ask me what is the number one question that you would like resolved? What is it you would like to know to advance medicine? I would say the fundamental barrier today is that we are not able to understand complex diseases, complex biological systems in a dynamic way. We're not sure exactly how cancer develops. We know that there are many pathways and many, many different signals that are involved, but we do not have a full quantitative understanding of that. We are not aware today of exactly how diabetes develops. We know its manifestations, but we have not yet discovered the fundamental elements of what is it in the biological systems that develops that. Why is, that that we, why is it that we've not made that progress? Because as we have known more, we have realized how complex biology is, and we needed to really develop new ways of understanding biology. So if you can bear with me for a second, I'm going to give you a little bit of a lecture about where biological sciences are going, where we see the frontier today. In this uh, drawing here, I am showing you here on the left side uh, DNA. This is the code of life. This is where all of our information is encoded. Inside the DNA, when you look at the DNA, there are regions that code for certain proteins. So I'm coloring here. Purple is for protein A, and green for protein B, and so on. What we also know is that through that mechanism, as the proteins are created, the proteins are not independent agents, and they interact with each other. So for example, you can see that protein A interacts with B, and when we put an arrow, that means that A provokes or promotes the formation of B. When we put a T sign like this, means that D stops the formation of E. But this is too simplistic. I want to take you now to the concept of network. In fact, all of these molecules are really not independent. They are interacting with each other within a complex network. So when you look at this network here, uh, you say, well, how am I going to understand this? How am I going to unravel the mystery in a particular disease? Well, one way we do this is to look at the DNA sequence and find out, for example, that there is a mistake, as you can see here. So this mistake here may be significant or not, but what we want to do is understand the mistake and understand what it does. In this particular case, this genetic abnormality 
has created an abnormal protein C, which is this one, and therefore C can no longer repress or stop the production of A, and it cannot promote D, and it cannot stop E. So what happens then in the network? Well, here's the picture. What happens is that the amount of A will go up, the amount of E will go up, and others will go down. We as physicians look at the blood tests and look at all the examinations we have, and what we see is only that A and E have gone up. We do not understand yet what is happening inside the, the genome and what has happened in the network of molecules. Now, you might say, well, since we have sequenced the human genome, all of these discoveries are now possible. And indeed, we are making very, very rapid discoveries. I looked at the abstracts uh, for the presentations today here, and there were discoveries made here in Qatar uh, this year and the year before, which are been, have been extremely important for our understanding of certain diseases. But let me show you what the challenge is. Let me show you why it's difficult. Now, if you then are a doctor and you can measure A and E, let's say cholesterol, you might say, well, I understand the disease, but let me show you why it's not possible. Suppose now that the mistake in the DNA was in B, and B was abnormal, and you realize that B also can have the exact same results. It will stop the production of C, which will not repress A and E. And what we call, what we call this disconnect is that for one appearance of a disease in one individual, there may be many different genetic abnormalities. And so the problem that we have in science today is to match what we observed in patients with what we know from the DNA and from all the mechanisms of biological systems. So, in fact, if you want to understand how our strategy of biomedical research is developed today, what I can tell you is that it is a multi-pronged strategy with multiple levels of understanding. What we're trying to do is understand how the DNA is encoded, how the DNA is expressed, how the DNA is then has normal or abnormal uh, sequences, and how it's transcribed, how it's translated, how it's regulated, how it becomes proteins, how are all these proteins interacting. And last but not least, what we do not want to forget is that our biological systems have evolved over millions of years but the environment has also changed. And the environment impact is critical for our understanding. For example, when you look at obesity, why is it that we are so susceptible to obesity? Many people believe that this is because over the many, many years of evolution, we have been really food deprived. We were not really set up to an environment where food is plentiful. And this is why we need to understand the gene environment interaction and this is where the research is going today. So what is happening fundamentally is that over the past 100 years, we have understood the elements, proteins, DNA, all of the components of the hardware of biological systems. What we need to do today is understand the software and understand exactly how all these networks are interacting, develop the tools to do it, but not just in animal models. We need to do it in human populations, and this will allow us to completely change our current classification of diseases and help better understand the environmental drivers that push a population from being adapted to its environment and then the next 30, 40 years have a completely different environment to which they're not adapted and that we need to correct. So when you look at the future of biomedical research, you realize then that biomedical research is no longer going to be done by any one kind of specialist. It will require the integration of molecular biology, bioengineering, computer science, physics, mathematics, chemistry. All of this has to come together, and therefore you have to destroy silos within your organization if you want to succeed. What I always say is that to succeed today in medical research, given the challenges, it is not enough to just be a research institution and a medical school and a hospital. You need to have multidisciplinary excellence across all fields of sciences. And to finish, if, I, if, you, if you let me, I would like to show you my own research and to show you how over a period of 20 years, 
my research has led me to the conclusions that I'm sharing with you. I was doing medical imaging, and in medical imaging, we develop scanners. Well, to create an image on a scanner, you have a certain amount of time. People didn't think that in my field, we will be able to replace what Dr. Yahoo always used in geography with magnetic resonance with no intervention, we could look at the vessels. So this is a image, for example, of the first success we've had. This is mid 1980s, <clears throat> where we had a machine where we, can, we could image the heart and all the vessels with not an intervention, but just with physics. Then we, once we did this, we said, well, <clears throat> if that's the case, then maybe what we can do now is image the cardiovascular system in a dynamic way, where well, we had to go back to the physics department to change the design of the machine. Then we had to go back to the computing department to write new software to reconstruct the images. And let me show you what happened next. So this is a patient where we are now looking at live pictures. The picture before was just showing you a static image. Now this is live, and in, 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 in we're looking at this individual. This is a woman who came to us from another hospital because she had amputations of her toes and nobody understood why. And here, let me show, orient you a little bit, if I may. Uh, what you're seeing here is, sorry. What you're seeing here is the, is the heart beating and this is the aorta and, and this is the spine. This is the spinal column with the spinal cord and this is something that we saw there which we thought was abnormal. And you can see this dark signal there which is floating in the aorta. So then we said, how do we treat this? So we went back to our laboratory and we took the entire data and we went to our high computing facility and we said, could we reconstruct this entire image from inside the body? And this is what we did. And this is the same patient now. Imagine that you are inside the human body and you're traveling within the vessels of this patient without even touching the patient. And here as we went, we saw this long string of blood clot which was attached to the vessel which was the cause of her disease. And we basically removed it with a very minimally invasive surgery. You can see here at this place the abnormality that is floating inside the vessel. The example I'm showing you is that we are integrating more and more areas of science to achieve this goal. Here I show you, for example, at the cellular and molecular level, how we are now tracking a cell. This is a, a macrophage, which is in fact chasing a bacterium. This is a bacterium which is trying to escape right here. And the macrophage is following the bacterium and eventually catching the bacterium. We had never seen how an infection was fought until we had these capabilities. Now the question that we have is, how does that cell sense the bacterium? How does it go towards it? And you'll hear a little bit more of this kind of research by my colleague, Peter Agri. Last but not least, it offers hope because once we understand nanotechnologies, for example, in this case, we have developed through another uh, group, small electrodes that are so small that you can implant them in the brain. And you can implant them in the brain and correct abnormalities. For example, this array of electrodes is smaller than a penny. You can look here, it's two by two millimeters. And in this patient here, we implanted these electrodes with a brain maker, a sort of pacemaker for the brain. This patient before treatment could not move. It was only 49 years old. He could barely move after we implanted the brain stimulator through this combination of multiple scientists working together. He is now playing with his children as if it was a normal individual. This is the hope. This is the challenge. This is what I would like us to be able to do because the greatest risk in science is to stop taking risks. Thank you very much.